I think, unfortunately, over time, uh, we have been given images of Jesus, perhaps in paintings or in, in Bible pages or, or the like of, of a Jesus who's pretty uh, sweet, uh, kind of like a powder puff. And uh, we have a sense that Jesus loves me um, and kind of that little song, Jesus loved me, this I know because the Bible has told me so. Just really kind of really easy kind of uh, images of who Jesus is. And it's a far cry from the truth. We see the truth today in this gospel passage from John in Jesus throwing people out of the temple. This is not a sweet uh, Jesus that doesn't affect us in any way. In fact, here we see a very passionate, zealous man who just has this fire in his belly about what's going on in his father's house in this temple that was for the Jews was everything, where heaven and earth came together. It was the sign of God's presence that they were the chosen ones, and they, uh, in that place, gave honor and worship to God and remembered who they were and who they were called to be. And as Jesus throws them out and he responds to the Jews who ask him, How, why are you doing this? He says, you can destroy this temple in three days, but I will raise it up again. So then he transfers, in a sense, the, the truth about where God really is, and it is in him, the very Son of God. He is the new temple. And then we can just go right from that to know that we now are the temple of God here on earth. As I've been kind of doing here for the last few weeks as I begin Mass, it's just to remind us, we are the body of Christ here on earth. We are that temple, not only individually, but as a community of faith. And Jesus has the same zeal, the same passion that we have our minds, our hearts, and everything directed in the right place, that they're directed to his Father in heaven, that we are this precious temple where heaven and earth come together. And so we are meant to glorify God with our lives. That's one of the phrases we use at the end of Mass. Go, glorifying the Lord by your life. So that everything that we do then needs to be directed toward God, no matter what it is. Our school, if we're at school, our school life, our work, our body, our family, our recreation, how we spend money, everything should be kind of brought to light and directed and done in light of what God's will in God's will is and whether it glorifies God or not. We are to be dedicated to God. We are the temple of God. And we've been given a lot of help in a lot of different ways. Of course, we know our sacraments, the Mass in particular, is the great way to help us to continue to grow in that reality of being the temple of God. We receive the very real presence of Jesus here in a, in a few minutes, uh, and that reminds us of how precious we are individually and as a community. But he's also given this great help in what we have referred to as the Ten Commandments that we see given to Moses and his people after they left Egypt. And so we have that passage from the book of Exodus, these Ten Commandments. The first three kind of direct us what our responsibilities are toward God. And the last seven are our responsibilities toward one another. And Jesus made it very clear in another part of the gospel, all the commandments, those ten and everything else, can be summed up with the two great commandments, to love God with all of our heart, all of our mind and soul, and our neighbor as ourself. So the first three are critical for us to be able to live the next seven. If we don't have our mind on God and who God really is, the God that's been revealed to us by Jesus, then it's going to be very difficult to do the next seven commandments of how we relate to one another and respect our bodies, our, our reputation, our property, uh, and all that that's mentioned in the next seven commandments. So I believe the first commandment is, is the most important, keeping God first above all things. And all the other commandments, of course, are important as well and help us to have an ordered life, a disciplined life, a purposeful life. And all that brings greater happiness and joy in our lives and help us to be able to live together in, in unity and concord and in peace. 
I'd like to point out, just not to go through all Ten Commandments by any means, but how sometimes in our modern day, people kind of, uh, kind of make fun of us, really, uh, about our commandments and the teachings of the church and what have you. Kind of it's old-fashioned. We have our heads in the mud and what have you. That we're not free and we're, we don't understand human life. In fact, the opposite is very true. And I'd like to point out commandment uh, number six, thou shalt not commit adultery or coveting one's wife, uh, the later uh, ninth commandment. Again, people have criticized us as a church for kind of concentrating on the sexual morality. And maybe we have overdone that in the sense of not bringing that in relationship to all the other things that are so important, dealing with the poor, justice, and the like. But on the other hand, it has been extremely important because look, look what has happened. In the 60s, 70s, or what have you, we had the so-called sex, sexual revolution, kind of this letting go of all of the, the rules and regulations that help us to guide how we relate to one another and take care of our bodies, etc. It was, it was meant to be, or is called something of freedom, to be really free. And the exact opposite has happened. Because now, today, we have more slaves, literally slaves, than the world has ever had before from human trafficking. The majority of whom have been enslaved for sexual uh, favors, prostitution, and the like. That is a result of this free sexual revolution has brought the greatest enslavement the world has ever known. The other thing that has happened is that kind of freedom about anything goes and, and what have you in terms of our sexuality and our relationships with one another is the, and along with technology, is the uh, kind of epidemic levels of pornography. And so it's so easily accessible People can kind of just get into it, but once you start, it's a highly addictive uh, reality, this pornography. And it begins, we're finding out, in fourth, fifth, sixth grades. And as, people, as kids get into it, it affects their minds and how they think. They can no longer think and develop as they're supposed to. It has be really become something at an epidemic level. It is because it's addictive, physically addictive. It, I don't have all the right words, but it triggers something in our minds that gives us a high, and then you just go after it, just like you do with other drugs and the like. So what was put out there by the world, so to speak, is something that was free, and, this, and we're kind of got our heads in the sand, has just turned out the opposite. And so I, just, I say that as an example, because all the commandments are extremely important, and they do help us to stay free, truly free, if our minds are always directed toward God, because God always helps us to get out of ourselves, out of our pleasures and those things, to be there for him and for others. And I might mention the seventh commandment as well, thou shalt not steal. It's much bigger than just simply have I taken uh, some money from my parents' wallet or taken something from the store. We can, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it, it talks about uh, something much bigger, economic justice, how people are treated, how our economy is meant to serve all people, not just a few favored people. And our uh, 4.2 program that's in the bulletin really fits into the seventh commandment. We're supposed to be conscious of the poor. So if, all, if everyone in the world had 4.2 acres, that would be an equal distribution of the resources and goods of the earth, whereas in the United States, we use 17.2 two acres. That is, in a sense, stealing from the poor. And so we have to broaden our sense of what the commandments are about. And just a little aside, being in a farming community, this particular thing you're going to find in the bulletin from the 4.2 program is going to upset a few of our farmers who are hog farmers or cattle feeders because it's kind of against meat. And I just say, take that you know, in stride, we all kind of do what we need to do, and that's part of our economy here. Um, and, but it's part of the program, so it's going to be something that's going to be kind of challenging for us in this particular area of the world. So 
I have these.